once again, everybody, and welcome to the third session of the uh, Center for Health Informatics virtual speaker series. It's me, of course, Caitlin, and today I'm introducing one of the CHI's integral members, Dr. Soren Knudsen. Soren is a Marie, Marie Curie postdoctoral scholar. In a few weeks, he will be leaving our team to join the Human Centered Computing Group at the University of Copenhagen as a part of his Marie Curie, Marie Curie Fellowship. We are sad to see him go, but this is a wonderful opportunity and we are excited to see what the future holds for him. He is interested in supporting people in understanding and making sense of data and in understanding the context in which this happens. Dr. Knudsen approaches his work from a user-centered design perspective, drawing on collaborations with people across a wide range of domains and contexts. In this talk, Soren will discuss the value of visualization and use this to contextualize some of his studies from professional and societal contexts that unearth broader concerns of visualization and predictive analytics in collaborative scenarios such as disagreement, accountability, and data-based augmentation. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Soren Knudsen. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, and uh, yes, it's true, I, I am, I'm moving very soon to, to Copenhagen. Uh, I just bought plane tickets last evening uh, to, to leave uh, Calgary, sadly, on, on Sunday. Uh, so this is this is my probably my last official uh, work uh, hour. So so I I'm gonna try and enjoy it as as much as I can, and I hope that you will do do that too. Um, so today I will talk about uh, data and in our lives, uh, and I want to make sure that I actually have my uh, my speaker notes if I can find them here, because they should should be here some yes so i will explore, explore the use of data visualizations in context for example in debate to support collaborative uh, decision making i'll show how this relates to work in social and collaborative visualization as well as explainable ai uh, from this i will discuss exciting research opportunities that i think lies lies ahead uh, and ultimately these these widen our perspective on human use of of visualization in a in a real world context so um first it i think it's important to think about what what is actually uh visualization um i, I think this the, the people that i'm speaking to here may not uh may not know this so uh you can think about all this this data and and you can think about um how you might want to find the sort of the needle in the haystack so let's return to that a bit later um I'm thinking one of the things that are interesting to think about in healthcare these days is, is that we have all this, this data now, we have all these electronic uh, healthcare records, but uh, we, are, we are suffering from, from what some people have called uh, this strip syndrome. Uh, in short, we have uh, data, we are data rich, but we are uh, information poor. So we collect a lot of data, but we are not yet at least um, able to fully um, leverage all the all the information that we might be able to to uh, um, attain from it um, so uh, clinicians spend much of their work on managing uh, medical records uh, and and one of the the things that we we could imagine is that uh, infovis might help them uh, spend less time maybe on on actually managing medical records but but gaining more information from them quickly so uh, broadly speaking, there are two approaches to understand data. You can take the approach that you think, okay, you have this data and you ask a machine, please analyze this data. Um, the other approach could be to, to say, well, I have this data, please help me analyze this for me, right? Please help, please help me analyze the data. So uh, when I think about statistics and machine learning, it's, I think about, uh, the idea that it's very much much uh, a service that that these these uh, algorithms and and um, techniques that they they can sort of do for you, um, while while you can say that that data visualization is is more trying to think about okay how can we help people uh, analyze data in in sort of this this may sound a bit like putting down on machine learning uh, or statistics for that matter. But it, what I'm trying to, to convey is that there's a difference in, in where uh, decisions and, and so on are, are taken and, and where, where the trust of, of, uh, of the, the approaches, approaches lie. 
Um, so, so, uh, oh, this is odd. This is in the wrong order. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'm missing a slide here. Anyway, you probably all know Anscom's quartet. So Anscom uh, created four data sets uh, that had the same uh, mean and variance, uh, and correlation and regression coefficients. Um, and showed that if you just look at that from a st statistics perspective, well, you could, you could see all these data sets as the, as the same. But if you if you um, if you plot them, you can see that they have some some characteristics that are when you're actually seeing the the, the uh, y and x values together, you can see well well actually uh, they look different. These data sets they have some some underlying um, uh, properties that are not captured by these statistics, and that's the point. Of course, you could maybe. Uh, you could describe this statistically, but if you are just uh, looking at these very common uh, basic statistic uh, uh, properties, then then you would miss uh, miss the difference between these data sets. Um, and that's that. The argument here is that maybe visualization is is that uh, that uh, that uh, technique that you can use to then. Um, then maybe can get some other information than, than you could from statistics. This is simplified, of course. So there's, there's a more recent example of, of this. Uh, this is different data sets that are, uh, that are again sharing uh, all, all the same uh, basic statistic properties. Uh, but you can see that, uh, that they, they have some underlying uh, 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 other aspects, right? So there's a dinosaur in there as well, for instance. It's kind of a silly, uh, a silly uh, example, but uh, it works to show that that uh, there are these these uh, assumptions that you you have to to understand. So so why would should we consider visualization? Um, one of the arguments for visualization is that basically any representation uh, can help people uh, see things differently. It makes some things clear. And possibly at the expense of making other things uh, less clear. Um, so that's that's maybe one one argument. So here's uh, a, a, a simple or a small example from uh, my work uh, during the, the, the last year, where we we thought about how can we simp uh, in a simple way how can we uh, com uh, communicate um, patients that were readmitted for for uh, for different. Uh, for different uh, reasons after I, a heart failure, I believe. Um, so uh, what was interesting here was that if you look at about uh, half of the data, or half of the patients, uh, they were readmitted for heart failure. But, but interestingly, there was another uh, group of patients that was a group of, you can basically, the rest of the patients were admitted for a lot of other, other uh, conditions. Uh, so we thought about how can you how can you show this, and, and this is what we came up with to sort of show okay there's there's 54 uh, percent of the patient population um, that was readmitted for for cardiac reasons, and 46 that was uh, readmitted for for non non cardiac uh, um, reasons within I believe 30 days. Um, so we thought about how can we communicate this, and and this is what we came up with to sort of say okay. This is visually showing that there's about an equal amount of, of patients that are coming back with, with cardiac uh, symptom, uh, uh, issues uh, and another uh, group that are coming back with, with other issues. And of course, there are some issues in, in this representation as well as there are in most, issue, uh, most representations. So we have, uh, we have some white spots in this 46% this area, for instance. Um, Right, so uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is one example where these two different representations help you do uh, different things. So, so the table allows for reading exact number of patients and and doing that very quickly. But the figure uh, requires uh, counting each individual square to reach that knowledge. So, so the uh, the figure is more about communicating that that rough estimate of of uh, half and half. Um, and so it's much easier to read this part to whole relationship in the figure. So compare the blue to two other colors. Um, 
So, so it's been argued that visualization helps uh, people see things easily. It helps them develop and assess hypotheses to discover errors in data, to expand memory, find patterns, uh, win arguments, or to do arguments at least, uh, and many other uh, uh, aspects. So already uh, more than 150 years ago, uh, people used visualization. Uh, if you actually look back in, and, and even, even in like archeology, span there are examples of, of uh, the use of, of, of uh, visual representations. So this is, this is a nice example from, from the medical domain. Uh, so this is John Snow that, that used um, this map of London to, to explain the, the cholera uh, outbreak. Uh, so he, he basically drew a number of deaths uh, on each, uh, each uh, street number um, and then just piled them up uh, to show well uh, how many uh, of these bars were there, that that's how many were were dying um, and he used this I think the the understanding now is that he didn't actually use it to to convince himself uh, what the what the uh, disease uh, the, the uh, vector of, of, of disease spread was but um, but he used it in in uh, trying to argue and convince others that that uh, people were uh, people were um, uh, spreading the disease through the the water pump, and, and they, uh, uh, as part of this this uh, argument, I believe he 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 made uh, people the uh, the authorities uh, uh, take off the the handle on the water pump so people wouldn't wouldn't drink from it anymore, um, and that uh, that uh, that had an, an effect. Um, also interesting from from this small visualization is. To notice that there aren't any people uh, dying at the brewery. I'm not sure if that's because people don't, didn't live there or because they they drank somewhere else, something else than than water from that pump. Um, but at least I, I found that curiosity in this this visualization. There's of course also Florence Nightingale that that used um, this visual representation to to uh, to communicate about. Um, um, san sanitary um, um, issues in in uh, field camps. Um, this is uh, in the visualization community. This is called a Florence Niding uh, a Nightingale uh, uh, rose. So you probably have seen this before. Uh, I'll skip over that. <clears throat> so these are some. This is this was some of the uh, these. The sort of interesting, I think, uh, visualizations, and there, of course, there are many more um, being pumped out uh, these days uh, from news media, for instance. Um, not the least, I think, uh, many people have started to really uh, see visualizations in in their daily life. I think this COVID situation has has actually has um, broadened the use of visualization. I believe to to more more pe everyday people than than, than uh, before. Um, so one of the strong, uh, strong aspects of visualization is that it, it's, it uses the visual perceptual system to, to help people easily uh, see uh, patterns, for instance, in the data. So if I were to ask you how many, how many zeros do you find here? Um, maybe, maybe you can uh, take a guess at it. Um, so I count at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, so doing this process, you have to scan. Uh, basically, you you will at least what I did was just scan line by line through this and trying to to see if I could uh, could count the zeros. And I counted eight, and I think that's actually correct. Uh, but if I do this. It's very easy to count the eight uh, zeros, right? So that shows that that there are there are aspects of our visual perception that that are somehow wired uh, to to help us uh, see things. Um, and we should, of course, when we think about uh, representing data, we should think about uh, leveraging that that visual system. Um, so again, if I were to to ask you to find this this stupid string of of, of of ones and zeros, um, that's impossible, right? We'll, we would give up. Um, they're here. Um, that's that's. It's just 
and if if you point to it or if you uh, if you highlight it somehow, it's very easy to to identify. Um, but um, again, just to show. So, but data visualization is a bit more than than just making sort of optimal uh, ways to represent data to to understand it. It also has an aesthetic. This is this is an example from uh, a a postcard uh, visualization project where uh, two visualization designers, uh, one moved, I believe, from, from Milan to New York, while the other moved from somewhere in the Midwest to, to London. Um, and they've, uh, and I think that was in, at the start of 2016. And somehow, I, I'm, I think they knew each other uh, from before, just, just from online, not very well. Um, but somehow they, they figured out that, okay, we're moving at the same time. Let's try and send postcards with small visualizations to each other. So what they did was that they sent a po postcard um, each week to one another um, where they had visualized some small aspect uh, of their life. Uh, so for instance, one week it was um, uh, their smartphone app usage uh, they tried to visualize. One, one week it was how many times did they look at their watch, uh, how many times did they laugh, and so on. And, and some of these are more personal uh, visualizations that, that doesn't only, con uh, they don't, don't only require this, this sense of optimal uh, reading. They also require, or they, they at least suggest that you could also think more uh, artistically about how to represent data. So this is, uh, they basically did this to a year and they wrote a book about it afterwards and so on. Uh, so it's been hugely, uh, hugely successful and a nice inspiration for a bit out, more out there uh, uh, visualization types. But it also goes to show that you can, you can actually create uh, visualizations if, if, you, if you want. You can create them from, from just uh, pen and paper. Uh, and actually that's, that's a process that I, I use in a lot of my, uh, my design work as well to try and, and basically just uh, draw a visualization or a small part of, of uh, visualization, uh, sorry, a small part of the data in the visualization to sort of get ideas. So it's more than uh, pretty pictures, but it is also sometimes pretty pictures. Uh, right, so, so this, is, this is some of the arguments and, uh, for, for visualization. And people have, have talked about, uh, trying to define uh, visualization. Uh, I'm mostly involved in, in what we call information visualization, is, which is more, that's, that's, I believe, the part of visualization that are closer to a lot of the work that goes on in this center, uh, where a lot of abstract data that doesn't have an, an implicit way of, of showing it would, would, uh, would, would fit. Uh, other parts of visualization are more thinking about how how can we um, how can we show, uh, for instance, X-ray data? Um, uh, but but there are some some aspects of that 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 make some visualizations uh, quite sensible to to choose already. But if we think more about abstract public public health data, for instance, uh, information visualization is is better uh, a better fit where where there isn't a, a nice and easy uh, obvious way to to represent data. So information visualization has, has been defined as the use of computer-supported, interactive, visual representations of abstract data, and importantly, to, to amplify cognition. So let's, let's unwrap that. Uh, so first of all, it's some use of. So, so that, that sort of implicit, it's human use of. Um, and then computer supported. Well, uh, these days we have computers that can create really complex visualizations for us. So we are of course using that. And with that, we get interactivity, uh, which is uh, very useful often to, to sort of uh, work your way through the data. And then as I've talked much about already, uh, it's about visual representations. So of course, if we think about a, a table, um, that's also a kind of representation um, it's arguably more symbolic than, than visual. Um, and then, then finally, this, this abstract part is, is, uh, is what I just talked about, and that's, that's what sets information visualization apart from, say, uh, what, what many people call scientific visualization. 
And finally, it's to amplify cognition. So, so it's the idea that, that we use it as humans to, to gain an, a better understanding of data. Uh, so that's, that's a very well, um, well uh, cited uh, definition of, of visualization or information visualization. So the rest of the talk, I will talk more about uh, some of my work, uh, which is about the use of, of data visualizations uh, in context. Um, and I will, uh, I will explore the use of, uh, of uh, sorry, uh, and that's, for example, um, in, uh, oh, I need to gain here. Uh, that's, for example, in debate and to support collaborative uh, decision making. So uh, that's about um, showing how this is related to social visualization. Um, to collaborative visualization and, and explainable AI. And from this, I will uh, uh, show some of the, or talk about some of the exciting research opportunities uh, that I think uh, lies ahead. Um, and ultimately, uh, this, this uh, broadens our understanding of, of human use of visualization in, in a real world uh, context. So uh, I think uh, maybe it is time for, Sorry, I need to have my, my speaker notes uh, synced up here. Um, so, so some people are saying that we are a wash in data, and this, this is what I'm trying to convey with, uh, with this figure. Um, organizations, large and, and small, uh, stockpiling data under the assumption that appropriate um, technologies will be invented to, to facilitate its analysis, uh, to generate insights, and to help make informed decisions. So, um, Yes, so the volume and, and complexity necessi necessitates inter interdisciplinary teams. And I think this is something that we know quite well from, from healthcare, where, where often there's a lot of people that are collaborating to try and to understand uh, parts on, of data to, to derive uh, um, insights. Um, so there's this increasing need for interdisciplinary teams to collaborate on understanding and analyze, analyzing data. Um, but decisions are almost never made in a vacuum. Uh, the entire process is often social and collaborative. What happened there? Yes. So this is why I, I uh, my one of my focus areas is is this focus on on concrete and collaborative uh, data analysis. Um, and there are different kinds of of, of collaboration uh, that that at least when you, when I think about uh, visualization research, uh, what what people might understand from collaboration. So the one is uh, where researcher visualization researchers uh, such as me collaborate with uh, domain experts, um, and this is uh, this is uh, how I see much of of. Uh, the, the collaboration that I have uh, have been doing with people here in the in the Center for Health Informatics, um, the CHI, um, that that I I've tried to sort of bring the the visualization perspective uh, to the table, and and think about trying to understand uh, problems that might be addressed uh, uh, in collaboration uh, uh, between uh, work in, in public health and and uh, and some work in, in visualization. Uh, so in in uh, the visualization literature, these types of collaborations are actually quite well described. Uh, they they talk about working with uh, with experts or domain experts, um, and there are methodologies like the design study methodology uh, designed by immersion from a previous uh, PhD from from this lab and, and many more uh, uh, approaches, and also uh, visualization researchers researchers or are uh, leaning on on work in human computer interaction uh, to sort of also uh, get get inspiration from from uh, methods in that domain. So that would be, for instance, contextual design where you are observing people do work and trying to interview them uh, while they're doing it to then inform design from that and and user centered research. For just to name a, a few of these. Uh, these methodologies that have been uh, that have bridged over into to visualization research. Um, 
So a few of my uh, collaborations, uh, and I yes, no, the Center for Health Informatics is, is part of this list. I, I just got unsure for a moment. Um, uh, has been uh, with the Danish Health Data Agency with uh, Microsoft Dynamics. I did some work with a bioproduction company that I'll return to. I've also worked with the Canada Energy Regulator. Uh, I work with Ask Nature, uh, who's, uh, who's doing a project uh, with uh, people here and, and uh, with people at NASA in, in Cleveland. Um, so I've been part of that and NASA is now taking some of our work and, and integrating it in some of their tools and, and countless other smaller uh, interactions or smaller collaborations. And there might be some slides that I'll, uh, well, I'll speak about those. Um, yes, but this, this, is, uh, this is that idea about domain experts. That, that's uh, well, a group of, of people that you might try and collaborate with as, as a visualization researcher. Uh, but there are other things uh, to think about when we, when we, when hearing the word collaboration in the visualization context, and that that is to think about well, sometimes domain experts need to collaborate as well, just with one another. So the focus there is about understanding how how can we maybe create uh, collaborative visualizations or visual analytics tools that allow people to to collaborate well and to 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 cl collaborate on on understanding data and gaining insights and so on. Um, and this uh, has typically been considered in two different um, ways. There's the, the approach of thinking about, okay, we can, we can install large displays and we can, uh, we can have people meet face to face, not recommended these days. Um, but the idea is that you, you get people to, to look at data and visualizations uh, in the same place at the same time. And uh, there is this focus in research, at least, on, on understanding how, how people can use uh, uh, shared interactive surfaces, such as, as large uh, smart displays, uh, just to name one, one concrete product. Uh, there's another aspect of, of trying to think about collaboration uh, uh, among people that use visualization. So that's, that's been described as social uh, visualization. And, and what's characteristic about that is that it's often different place and different time. Uh, so for instance, all of these, uh, these uh, news articles uh, that are coming out these days about COVID, where people uh, or uh, journalists have, have included visualizations as part of that, that could be one example. That could be examples of, of this, this social use of visualization. So it's it's seen as as, um, as a way to to maybe in a in a more societal context as well to to gain better use of data. So there's this focus on web and sharing visualizations and states of visualizations, for instance, just by by sharing a web link. And technology plays an important role in both uh, both of these two two aspects. So what's interesting about these two is that they actually feel nicely um, this either same place, same time, or different place in different time. And this, it turns out, is, is, is part of a concept that's been described previously in the human-computer interaction literature. So, so importantly, there's, of course, also the combinations of these two, the different place, same time, and same place, but different time. And this is what, uh, what is known as the, uh, the CSCW matrix. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So, and, and this, this is already well established in human computer interaction. So what's interesting is that we have considered some of these in, in, uh, in visualization, but uh, there is also some, some of these that we have not considered that much. Uh, much of my work has been in this face-to-face -face interaction and, and last displays. So I'll talk a bit about uh, some of my projects here and I'll just keep an eye on the time. Uh, so one project I did with the Danish Health uh, Data Agency, uh, where we basically, uh, we had a long-term collaboration here with a group of domain experts. So it's, it's both collaboration uh, with these domain experts and it's collaboration uh, within uh, this team of analysts. And these, they, they were concerned with understanding expenses in the Danish healthcare sector. 
So uh, we uh, did some characterization of their work and, and sort of the team. Um, and from that, we concluded that, that at least here, uh, analysis happened more collaboratively. And this is, this is the first study that I did that sort of gave this understanding that we should, we should think about um, collaboration more in, in visualization. Uh, we also uh, created a system for, for these, uh, this team uh, to, to support their uh, data analysis. Um, and what we saw was that this face-to-face -face interaction may uh, bridge interdisciplinary knowledge gaps and it may facilitate understanding of, of data provenance or analysis provenance at least. Uh, it also may facilitate uh, data interpretation because it's, for instance, if, if one uh, collaborator can understand one part of the data and another another part, then, then being together uh, facilitates that more. And, and if they can look at the data at the same time, that's more the, more the better. Um, and it also may be easier to mediate disagreement. So if, if they actually, if people have, yeah, disagreement. So uh, basically what we experienced here was that in contrast to how uh, the visualization literature before had considered uh, people working individually to analyze data, uh, for instance, uh, Candida and all said uh, or quoted uh, an analyst uh, saying, working on a team is the exception in my experience. That's almost 10 years ago now. Um, this is not what we saw. We saw analysts that worked in an informal work environment divided in three to four person offices. And while analysts were responsible for their own tasks, they would frequently, as in many times a day, ask other team members for help and discuss their problems. So rather than a single analyst, we, we found from this that it's important to consider teams, uh, a team of analysts and how to support them. And we did this through observations and contextual interviews, design workshops, and constructing and discussing lo-fi prototypes, and then finally discuss, design and construct this, uh, this uh, hi-fi prototype, so a, a working prototype that we could deploy uh, uh, for the, uh, the team. So uh, we did observations. Um, this is uh, just a fire, uh, fire, what do you call these? Um, an escape plan, I suppose, uh, that we used to, to sort of gain an overview of, of the offices and where, how, where people were sitting and collaborating and so on. This is just looking like uh, any other office. Uh, we did notice a few important uh, 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 artifacts, for instance, uh, from, from these contextual interviews uh, where we also, and where we collected notes and so on and, and uh, did recordings and so on. Uh, so one of the things that we identified as important was this, this book here, which is a book they, they produce on an annual basis, which contain uh, rates for different treatments in the Danish, uh, Danish healthcare sector, just as an example. Um, so we also did some workshops uh, to try and think about more imaginary, just think about and imagine how can we use uh, large displays to analyze data. So we had, I believe, uh, two to three participants per workshop, and they, then we did um, about 10 workshops. And during the workshops, analysts imagined working with tasks and, and data, uh, their own tasks and data, but using a large displays. But in reality, as I said, they were uh, they were using a whiteboard. We conducted 11 workshops within healthcare policy, website analysis, phone log analysis, astrophysics, logistics, internet game statistics, information retrieval, artistic photography, and EU uh, emission statistics. So quite a, a diverse set of, of workshops. And some of these insights we took with us to, uh, to basically uh, inspire this work on, on the prototypes. So one of them was this trail of thoughts that you can create one visualization and then, then ex explore a part of uh, the data in that visualization further. Um, also the issues of a lot of display space to show uh, intermediary menus. Um, so from that we, we created a page, which uh, I think, uh, I, I, I will show a video of that in a moment. So basically, PAID uh, was, um, was uh, taking a central table that the, this team of analysts uh, 
created uh, every year. Uh, basically, there was one row for for each admission to a Danish hospital in, in this table. Um, so about 13 million rows per year. And, and this table uh, was so central to the work that we basically created uh, this page system to, to support analysis of this, collaborative analysis of, of this table. Um, uh, this is some of the goals. I'll jump straight into the video because I think that actually may be more interesting. So this is, this is one ex small example of, of uh, the system where you can basically, you have all the columns in your, in your um, header of this table. Um, and then you can just drag a column down and then you get uh, a small visualization. Uh, you can also drag uh, columns down to configure the, the axes. You can uh, take data from one visualization and use that to filter another one. You can uh, synchronize axes so, so you have the same axis encoding across uh, visualizations. And you can uh, explore, this is that trail of thoughts that I showed before from the workshops, where you basically take a part of the data and, and explore that in, in another uh, visualization or view as it's set here. Uh, you can clone views, just dr dragging with two fingers. And you can also explode views, so you see that views, but now broken down on all the, the different values in, in a column. So here, uh, one visualization is broken down by gender, so, so you get two other visualizations next to it. If you have a column with a lot of, of um, different va values, then, then uh, there are some smart uh, ways to handle that as well. Uh, so this small scenario is an analyst that, that um, compares each distribution of, of uh, women giving birth. Uh, so uh, he's dragging first. So this uh, first visualization had women giving birth. Then he's dragging out uh, two age bins. So now he have uh, ages of women giving birth between 20 and 40. And then he's looking at that in different areas of, of Denmark. And then he can uh, scroll through that list and see that, that there is a slight tendency to, for women to be uh, older when they give birth in the, uh, in the, uh, in the met metropolitan areas. Right, uh, so, so from all this work, uh, the main, I think, interesting insight is that uh, uh, analysis happens collaboratively. And, and of course, also some more concrete aspects of this, this system that we created. Um, I already said this before. I want to skip this because that's uh, some of the uh, more technique-based stuff. Yeah, so we also did a um, we also did some work on on what we call proxemics to to basically use your body position to interact with visualizations on last display. So here it's, it's uh, houses for sale. Um, but lately we've also uh, used the uh, Bertin visualization room for, for doing some of this, uh, this, uh, this work on, on proxemics. So basically moving back and, front and, back and forth in front of these, these displays in this room uh, using this, uh, this uh, motion tracking system that we have installed in that. And this, some of this has been published recently at the uh, the Eurovis uh, conference in, I believe, May, uh, together with the uh, uh, two uh, students that that was interning at the center. Um, we've also been discussing uh, some work uh, around uh, how to uh, visualize uh, data about adverse adverse events uh, based on on the underlying algorithmic approaches and so thinking about how can we show these these results that we're getting from machine learning for instance and thinking about how can we show uh, show that um, so one one example of this is uh, a, a natural language processing system uh, marks up uh, how likely uh, different parts of, of a chart is to uh, be about uh, pressure ulcers. so here um, the, uh, the predictions are given and, and the, the red uh, colors here indicate that there might be something, something in this, this sentence that has to do with, with pressure ulcers. 
So if we think about how we could visualize that, we could just remove the, uh, the text altogether and just have the, 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 the values and the, uh, the red and, and orange here. Uh, but we can compress this even more and think about, well, this, this entire paragraph could, could basically be condensed down to, to this, this small, um, small um, rectangular area with, uh, with an orange red and then orange again. Uh, if we dive into that sentence of, of uh, the red, the, the, the pressure also sentence, we can see how much different, uh, different uh, terms in that sentence are. Uh, um, has to do with with pressure also, and, and not, quite unsurprisingly, uh, also itself is is something the algorithm uh, expects to to be important for for this this uh, adverse event. So the idea here is that we can make very compressed uh, representations of of outputs from from algorithms to show well maybe there is something about this this type of adverse event that you should. Uh, uh, have a look at, um, and you could you could imagine you you maybe have just a, a small um, grid of of uh, all the common um, adverse events, and then each chart would basically uh, uh, give you or uh, you would just you would basically have one of these grids for for each chart, and then you can see well uh, if anything unusual uh, comes up in in. Um, in a chart, you would you would be likely to be able to see this from from this visualization, and you can imagine maybe there are wards that have a typical signature of these these grids. So all patients often look alike. Uh, there there is there is likely some some uh, some um, some uh, wards that that uh, have uh, have uh, the same signature, right? And then you would uh, when you knew, knew that signature, you'd also know that okay. This is what I, what 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 is common, and then if if uh, if a, a patient or a chart some uh, in in a situation then turns out or looks differently, then you might know that that this is this is something that you should look into. So this I I think is a nice somewhat simple example of where uh, machine learning and visualization can, can play well together. Um, yeah, so, so one of the questions here is, if we visualize data, would clinicians form a sense of how abnormal data would look? Um, and can we maybe provide overviews of different patients and units? Uh, and can we even use these visualizations to understand not just individual, but also multiple uh, patient trajectories? Um, so another part of my work is, is about this, this idea of using large displays, as I said earlier, to support collaboration. And this is, this is funded partly by, by uh, a, a European grant, a, a Marie Curie um, grant. Uh, so that's what I will uh, return to, to Denmark to, to uh, do in the next year. Uh, and this is, this is uh, supported mainly by that, but also uh, many other partners. Uh, and this this is about that uh, collaboration face to face, um, but I think one of the interesting things, uh, and probably something that I've actually learned over the last year in the center, is that that it's a bit naive to think about just supporting one of these contexts. When we think about people that want to to collaborate on understanding uh, data together, all of these uh, these four um, four quadrants of this. Um, what is called the CCW matrix. So it's called CCW because uh, that's, that's um, an acronym for computer supported collaborative work. All of these, these uh, quadrants uh, are in play. Sometimes we, we sit in the same meeting room and we look at data together. Sometimes uh, we, uh, we meet over Zoom or, or whatever platform. Um, so we're in different places, but at the same time, we also email about data, right? So, so and of, of course, we also sometimes uh, inhabit the same space and maybe use that to, to, uh, to communicate about data. Um, there's some, some examples of, for instance, um, um, uh, boards that you use in agile software development might be one example of this, where you, uh, where you will uh, put up uh, physical uh, stickies about different tasks and so on. 
so there's some coordination and of course also in production uh, context that's that's highly uh, relevant sorry uh, that should have gone so this this is actually one of those those examples where we have the different time but the same place uh, I did some work uh, with with people uh, uh, at a production plant where we were interested in in visualizing uh, it's just a few pictures here visualizing uh, flow uh, through a filter uh, production unit so basically this this company was interested in in uh, producing pectin which is uh, which is uh, used in uh, for instance as a gelling agent agent in for instance uh, jam from and they produce that from from citrus uh, peels this is this is the uh, the end product and that's used in in strawberry jam here for instance this is danish yorba that's strawberry in danish basically uh they they had this filtration unit uh where they were uh filtering out uh this this uh peel uh which at that state was a, a juice uh to to get the the most uh um the, the larger uh, uh uh part of the uh, the juice out um get that filtered so uh they had these operating uh uh, uh Operations room, ah, well, in control rooms. <laughs> just lost, just the term there. Control rooms uh, to to keep an overview of the uh, of the uh, process, um, and then basically they were trying to optimize for for uh, getting a lot of uh, flow through these filters um, without them clogging too fast and so on. So we uh, we created this is this is the uh, system that they had when we started working with them. And then we uh, we try to optimize to for some of these these goals of more more uh, more uh, more optimal and more stable uh, stable production. Um, and this is this is one of those examples where uh, where we were working both with domain experts, which was uh, uh, chemists and so on, and then also operators that had just training in in working in the filtration. Um, and we did some design works. This is some of our early um, sketches, and then we we created basically a system that that allowed them to to gain an overview of uh, of the current situation in a in this filtration uh, unit, and then also be able to predict uh, when it was likely to that one of these these filters uh, were getting clogged and and needed cleaning. So what's interesting about this this project is this this idea of of predictive analytics, where we have uh, past data uh, and then try to visualize that together with with data uh, that's predicted for the next uh, twelve hours of production, and what they're basically trying to aim for is to have um, a situation uh, of of steady flow through the filters and only cleaning one one filter at a time. Uh, so here the the issue. That is that is shown in the system as these two uh, rec red rectangles here is that the filter two and filter ten are are um, likely to to be needing cleaning at the same time and then the operators can react to that and say well maybe I if I adjust this this parameter in the production then then one of the filters would will uh, will uh, need to be cleaned a bit faster so it's it's running a bit uh, uh, with a bit higher pressure uh, until it needs cleaning. Um, right, so uh, and there's something about handling uncertainty and so on in this system as well. Uh, I think I had a, I didn't. Okay, I thought I had a video of the system in, in use. Um, I've also done some work uh, on on thinking about uh, how to communicate data to the public with the with the Canadian Energy Regulator, which turned out I think to uh, as of now. Uh, five different visualization products. So this is an example of of trying to think about not just domain experts at the Canada Energy Regulator, but also thinking about okay, how do we communicate data about um, energy and pipelines in Canada to to the public? Uh, so this example here is about um, incidents happening on on uh, CER regulated pipelines uh, that we created for them. So that's that. That's sort of trying to span out some of the 
the point uh, work that I've done in these these different um, quadrants of the this, this CSCW matrix. And uh, then one of the last things that I've been doing is is this uh, this project with uh, with a lot of people at the, uh, the the Center for Health Informatics to 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 um, to create a, a local Alberta-based response uh, to to the uh, the pandemic. Um, so to 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 uh, create a tool for for the public and for decision makers in in city of Calgary and Alberta. Uh, to to gain uh, a better understanding of, of the, the the COVID data, so that's another example of, of trying to to work with uh, with uh, I think right. Um, I want to see. So so one of the things that are interesting when you think about this public 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 realm is to think about is this collaborative data understanding. It's definitely I think social. Um, can you use visualizations for for supporting arguments and maybe uh, also disagreement? Um, and how do we think more openly about uh, accountability of decisions and so on? And how how does that fit into to to uh, data and decisions? Um, and this this idea of of using visualizations as as uh, as artifacts in, in argumentation, I think is quite interesting. One of the things we saw from this this work with the bioproduction company is that that the operators sometimes made decisions that that senior management or management in general um, were not understanding. So there was this this tension between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the different. Uh, uh, employees in that that organization, and we actually saw them using visualizations to to sort of see well when I did this at that time the the system said this so I did that and so on and and hopefully then then when people can can argue for these things using not just their own recollection of what happened but but I actually point to to these uh, these uh, this data uh, hopefully then uh, there's a chance for for not just disagreement and argumentation, but also to, to mutual understanding of, of uh, approaches and so on. So um, some of these, these aspects that are a bit more um, critical of visualization, uh, I think is interesting. So, so we've done some work on, on trying to, uh, that argues for, for thinking about uh, uh, a more uh, critical uh, view on visualization, uh, as as uh, as also has been done uh, in in journalism, for instance, thinking about when when photography was was a new uh, medium, um, people took took it for granted and thought that well, it, it represented the truth. Um, I th this this one of the, our, our recent papers argues for also thinking about well. Maybe maybe data visualization is going through that same uh, same process at the moment, and pixel clipper is another um, example of some of my my work in this public realm that that talks about uh, how can we in a collaborative um, situation how can we explain data uh, when when we're face to face, based on on some work we did on on communicating in in events about this uh, CER uh, data. And there's a lot of other work that I couldn't cover, but that I also find interesting. Uh, so that was a bit about my my work and a bit about visualization. Uh, some focus on concrete and collaborative uh, data analysis and what I think about that. Uh, so uh, some of the future directions I think is to to try and and gain a better understanding of trade-offs between prediction performance and understandability. If we think about this field of explainable AI. And visualization and algorithmic accountability and 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 so on. This this field, when you think about that, I think that's some of the the interesting aspects. And when sh uh, I think it's interesting to consider when should we choose performance over under understandability. So we have a complex visual uh, a complex machine learning model, but but we can't really communicate it well with uh, visual representations. Is there sometimes that we should still choose that or? Is it always the better choice to to choose a model that are more easily explainable and have a, a nice visual representation for it? Um, 
So, so some of the things that I've talked about in, in coloration uh, have also sort of hinted at, at uh, the importance of understanding and advancing current, uh, uh, understanding uh, um, how people uh, basically collaborate the, the work pra practices in data science and to create and evaluate technologies that, that support people working. Um, and then something about uh, the social aspect of visualization. How do we create meaningful discourse around data and predictions? How can we share uh, visualizations online in, in a meaningful way and argue about them and with them and so on? How do we uh, create uh, yeah, this, uh, these opportunities for online discourse around database uh, decisions uh, on, that, that is used, uh, using interaction and, and visualization? Uh, and how can we create tools that allow people to interact with predictive models online and engage in a meaningful discourse around data and predictions with great potential for, for societal benefits? I think one of the things we've seen with COVID is that, that people actually, they're at least interested in looking at, at uh, COVID visualizations. Uh, so, so the next step is how, how can we use this interest to then also so, uh, create better uh, societal benefits? Um, this is some of my collaborators, and here is uh, uh, some of the, the people in this center and, and uh, elsewhere that I've been fortunate to collaborate over, with over the years, um, and a lot of, of students as well. Um, that's it from me. <laughs> that was a bit longer than anticipated. I hope you uh, uh, stayed with me, um, and I'm happy to, to take questions. For more information on who we are and what we offer, visit our website at coming.ucalgary.ca forward slash CHI. If you are interested in our services, collaborating with our team, or have any other inquiries, contact us via email at chi at ucalgary.ca.